Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. Uh, my name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Today I'm gonna share with you some quotes uh, that I shared on Twitter. I'm also gonna go through and give some of my financial opinions and what I'm seeing in the market, um, some other information on Twitter and whatnot. So we'll kind of just run through this and uh, I'll give you my uh, opinions on it. So first I'll start with some of the quotes here. Uh, I've got Peter Lynch, he is a famous investor. Uh, I do think that his quote is applicable to the time that we're going through right now, and I'll tell you why. As he says, my best stocks have been the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year I've owned them. It's not the third week, the fourth week. People want their money very rapidly. It doesn't happen, Peter Lynch. And there's a lot of truth to that. You're going to have to be patient to win this game. Uh, your timing we try the best that we can. Uh, our timing mechanisms are using ratios and market conditions. That gets us pretty close. Pretty close is, in, is usually measured in months or years. And sometimes the markets don't turn out the way that you want them to, even though the market conditions are completely ripe. Just because something's ripe doesn't mean it has to happen immediately. Uh, we can see things in the markets that are 100% facts. And what's 100% fact? If a ratio is cheap uh, compared to history, that is a fact. Uh, it doesn't mean that it can't get cheaper. It doesn't mean that it can't stay cheap for a while. Uh, but it, it can uh, give us an indication that it is, in fact, cheap. Um, the timing of the market can be very difficult. And the way that things progress can be different from what you expect. So what you do is, is you buy multiple sectors that are cheap, you position in it, you look at the market conditions, say, okay, the market conditions are ripe, it can happen at any time. Your timing can't be that pinpoint because it just, I mean, you can try to use technical analysis to pinpoint it. Uh, sometimes it works very well. Uh, a lot of the times it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's easy to get a really good buy point, uh, in my opinion, uh, to buy really, really low, but sometimes they don't respond or react immediately. You have to be in it for a little while. You have to drag along the bottom for, for a little bit, especially if you're trying to catch the bottom of bottoms. It just takes time for things to develop and for the returns to gain momentum. So matching your time frame and expectations and being able to, to, to gut the movements in the market is what makes professional investors, professional, and amateurs, amateurs. Amateurs can't ride through that. Professionals can. And that's where all the returns are at. And he's just basically stating that. Um, here's John. He, he posted this. Uh, this is a gold chart. And this looks very bullish where we're at. We're sitting on top of patterns. And that is typically where I buy. That's, that's just something that is ingrained into me. You buy on the retest off that support line. Gold is doing that, and so is platinum and a lot of these other metals. Uh, I buy that, and I buy them, and I just sit in them. We know they're cheap. We can read ratios. Uh, we know the market conditions are changing favorably, and we're sitting on top of technical analysis chart patterns. What else can you do as an investor? There is nothing else that you can do. That is all you can do. All you can do is identify when an asset and liquidity flows could potentially enter into these companies, which is your market conditions. You can. Look at the ratios to tell you if it's cheap or expensive and compared to history. And you look at the technical analysis. If you're sitting on top of patterns, you've broken the pattern, you've done the retest. Everything is there that that is uh, for the alignment. And that's all you can do as an investor. You can't force the stock to go up. You can't wish it or hope it. Uh, you can't do anything else than basically those steps and measures. Here is uh, China continues to dump U.S. Treasuries. Their holdings just reached a new decade low. Uh, so we are seeing, uh, we'll call it uh, companies and countries dumping treasuries. And that's why the interest rates are going up. Now, that money has got to rotate. Usually when you sell something, it transfers into dollars. Then those, those dollars are going to buy something else. That's something else. I mean, I'm speculating here. That liquidity will enter into precious metals and commodities. And it's, it's a lot of liquidity finding a much smaller 
uh, home. So it's it's going to blow those things up, I think, to the upside. It just takes time. It takes time. Here's a TLT uh, from Uselink. Uh, we have now reached the 100% measured move, and we are below the 2018-2019 repo crisis level, where credit froze up. We Also, we might have finished the 1 to 5 correction wave. Uh, he's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in his... Uh, this is the iShares TLT index for bonds coming back down. And we'll see if that's the case. But I like that chart there. Uh, here's one, uranium. Uh, as always, we need a double bottom before the next big rally. Uh, that's what I was talking about with, with Scott. We get these little kind of lead-in moves uh, almost every time. They're like double bottoms. Uh, we were talking about this when it was up here, and I said, well, do you think we're going to get a return move? If I get a return move, I'm going to be a buyer. Well, we're getting that return move, and in order to make money, in my opinion, you have to be a buyer at the, the bottom of that double bottom. And I think, hopefully, that's where we're at, is that we're at this double bottom. Uh, obviously, nobody knows the future, but uh, that's where I buy, is I buy these little double bottoms, and I just, you know, that's what I do. I'm like a machine. Uh, getting the facts straight is important. 84% of the world's primary energy today comes from fossil fuels. That is down 86% in the year 2000. So percentage-wise, from the year 2000, uh, we haven't really cut our fossil fuel usage that much, only 2% uh, of the energy mix. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. I'm going to skip over that one. He does some swearing in there. Uh, there's our video if you want to see it, the liquidity in the system, potential recession. We've got the holy power burn. Total gas demand is at an all-time high for this time of the year. And that's with 2 billion cubic feet per day of LNG gas exports offline. Here's the power burn as it goes up, and it's the demand for natural gas in billion cubic feet per day is very high. Uh, looking at the total gas demand, you can see it's at a, a higher level given the past five years that we're at the highest level during this time frame. Uh, this is a very nice chart. I really like how they laid this out. And then we've got uh, liquefied natural gas exports declined over this time frame with the terminal that's down and is being delayed to start back up because of some damage to it. So um, that's also why natural gas went down was this, uh, this big decline here. But again, I'm just kind of going over some data so you guys understand it. Uh, Stephanie says, May producer price index slowed to 10.8% year over year from 10.9%, up from the 18th consecutive month. Goods prices accelerated to 16.6% from 164 and gasoline now above $5 in many states. Services up 7.6%. The reality is inflation remains quite high, not peak or peaking. <clears throat> That's important. It's not peaked yet. It's it's just high. Uh, PPI usually is an indicator slightly before consumer price index. Uh, Biden and, and, Min and, and Min announces strategic petroleum reserve release sales. It's official. 45 million more barrels of oil to be sold from the strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, bullish oil. Look up thread for why. So they're releasing more oil. They're trying to contain the, the price of oil. They're trying to suppress it. Uh, it did. I mean, it does work for a short period of time, but uh, it's going to go higher. We have a problem in oil. Here's commodities versus the S&P 500. Up uh, an update from Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, chart one is the 79% below the 2008 commodity super cycle peak. So we are still here, and we're we're set about 80% below the commodity peak in 2008. In this chart over here, chart two, 96% below the 1970s peak. Versus the S&P 500. That's the ratio. Last time stagflation was the prevailing economic backdrop. Uh, so this is, we are way below. Uh, We're at 0 0.2 versus 4.5 given the ratio uh, versus the S&P 500. So we have a long way to go uh, up in a commodity super cycle if, if that's what we are in. So the value is there. Uh, it says the velocity of this move has been staggering. 30-year fixed rate mortgages are at 6.3% versus 5.5% last week. Uh, that is a very large rate of change. So that is something that we need to look at. <clears throat> and we're looking at all these things. I, I just want to kind of make some comments here too. We're looking at all this data. 
And I know some people, I think they made a comment on, um, you know, look, we're, we're below a trend line or something like that. in some of these, in some of these, uh, commodities or, or mining companies or whatever, uh, I guys, I, I, I'm going to stay the path so long that the ratios are cheap and that the market conditions are ripe. Uh, even though a technical chart pattern can look uh, like it's breaking to the downside or something. Remember, all these people know that people are looking at technical charts all over the place. Um, and they're going to try to force things out of patterns to get you to get into a basically a bear trap. Uh, given where we are with inflation, given where we are with interest rates and the positive momentum that interest rates has, I think that money is rotating and I think it's going to rotate where I'm at. That is why I have such a rock solid outlook or viewpoint and why I continue to add into things that are down. I think that we still have an energy crisis. There's a reason there's a reason they're releasing oil from the strategic petroleum reserve. And we have problems. I'm not going to sell when we've got problems. Uh, these problems need to be solved. We need to see inventories grow. Then I will be looking to, to exit. I just don't think we're there yet. I, I think we're years away from that. And the energy crisis is just getting started. So there's no reason to, to, to be selling something at the beginning of an energy crisis. In fact, I'm buying more because I think the energy crisis hasn't been solved. And I, and I think their solutions are not good solutions. So I, I just, to me, I don't see the, the immediate need. I don't get scared out of a, a, a position when inflation and energy is causing the problem. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, I was looking at some other stuff too. Uh, I was looking at the Case Shiller um, about the housing bubble that they were predicting in 2003 that did not happen. Uh, some of the stuff that they were looking at, like sentiment and other stuff, I, I'll be honest, guys, it was quite eye-opening reading this and understanding what these guys look at and then just thinking, why would you look at these as indicators? They're not even good indicators. And I, I've, I've been trying very hard to understand why they were looking at some of these indicators like sentiment and these other things. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't matter. Uh, the, the thing that matters is, do you have homes to sell or do you don't? Or, do you have homes? Yes. Or do you not? No. If you don't have homes to sell, you can't claim a bubble. You have to wait for that inventory to come. And that's why they got it wrong. That's why with their prediction of the housing bubble in 2003 was so far off and so far away from the top. <clears throat> so at least I'm learning about the, the competition <clears throat> and what, what others think. And I just think that what they look at is, I think there's more meaningful data to look at. I'll put it that way. And that's why I started a website. That's why we have platinum membership. You can see the data that I look at. I can show you these things. Uh, I'll post that on the website here shortly. Uh, with the the things that I was looking at with uh, the Case Shiller Index with Robert Shiller, so uh, I'll share that on the website for uh, for the Silver and Platinum members here shortly. Uh, and if you guys want to join, it's in the description link below. You can join the the website if you'd like. But I just I'm just looking at things, uh, and and my conviction of the thesis being correct and all that, it's still all intact. The fundamentals haven't changed. I've got some quotes talking about all this, about the fun looking at the fundamentals, understanding the fundamentals. Um, what are some some things like looking at inventories and stuff like that? Uh, if the fundamentals haven't changed yet, there's no reason to change. You have to see those fundamentals change. They have to be solved if there's problems. Uh, the largest problems with the largest impacts will be the most uh, rewarding uh, for investment. So I think we have an energy crisis. I think the largest rewards are in the energy sectors. Uh, at this time, and we have inflation still that's persistent. So that's kind of what the data is telling me, at least from Twitter. Uh, persistently high producer price index, persistently high consumer price index. Interest rates are going up. They raised the interest rate 0.75 percent, and the problems still persist in the system. So that's what I see. If you guys like the content, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Subscribe to the website below. Platinum membership's the one that I would do. And thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.